In the two previous messages on the subject of the Christian's warfare, we've considered the two antagonists, namely Satan on the one hand and the Lord Jesus Christ on the other. The person and position and power of each have been before us. And we've seen also the victory of Christ over the adversary, the devil, and have noticed the believer's identification with Christ in this victory and where he sits on the throne of God, there in the place of supreme authority. And the believer, because of this identification with Christ, has every advantage that he needs in wrestling with Satan and his spiritual forces of evil. In Ephesians 6 and 12, we learn our wrestling is against spiritual hosts of wickednesses in heavenly places. It is there in those heavenly places where our victorious Lord sits, and it is there that we encounter the foe. And this, you see, should give us an absolute confident attitude, not in ourselves, but in Him with whom we find ourselves identified there in the very place of our conflict. And because it is there that we wrestle, it shows us that it is no ordinary warfare. The location of the battlefield determines the nature of the conflict. It is in heavenly places, I repeat, and thus it is a spiritual warfare. Now this also determines the kind of weapons we must use. In 2 Corinthians 10.4 we read, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now in Ephesians 6 and 12, we read, We wrestle. The we, when traced through Ephesians, is found to refer to those redeemed through the blood of Christ, chapter 1 and verse 7. And they are those identified with him in death, resurrection, and exaltation in chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. They are his workmanship, chapter 2 and verse 10. They are members of his body and members one of another, chapter 4.25 and 5.30. The we is synonymous with the brethren of chapter 6 and verse 10. Why then are the we involved? Why, if the warfare is between the two seeds, Christ and Satan, and Christ has already been victorious, why does Satan attack the brethren of Christ? Why is he against the church, the body of Christ? Now, I believe it is because Satan still has venomous hatred for Christ. And because of the church's position in Christ and with Christ, though Christ is in heaven, his body, the church, still represents Christ here on earth. In fact, the church is the most damaging evidence of Satan's defeat on Calvary, and it's the greatest proof of Christ's resurrection. Satan realizes that he has just as much to cope with in the church on earth as he did when Christ was on earth. The relationship between Christ and his church is seen in those early days of the church's history when Satan, through Saul of Tarsus, was trying to obliterate the name of Jesus. He was extremely successful until the Lord stopped Saul on the way to Damascus. When the Lord said to Saul, why persecutest thou me? From this we learn that to persecute the member of the body of Christ was to persecute the Lord himself, the head of the church in heaven. Then, too, Satan attacks the individual believer because the believer who lives by faith in his heavenly position and walks worthily here in this world, filled with the Spirit, he's the one who is able to stand against the wiles of the devil and to withstand in an evil day. Personal spiritual growth and enjoyment of the heavenly riches in Christ spell the doom for Satan's efforts to rob Christ of his glory. Hence Satan directs, you see, his attacks to cause the believer to stumble in his walk and to thereby fail and dishonor his Lord. But the saved and separated, spirit-filled Christian is Satan's greatest enemy on earth. The church, the fullness of him that filleth all in all then, and the 
Christian, arouse the fury of the oppressor. And hence, you see, we have to wrestle against him. Now, if in warfare it's of first necessity to know the enemy's position, the second is to know his tactics. Satan's empire, another has written, is ruled with a settled policy. His warfare is carried on with a systematic strategy. The end of quote. Now, because of this, no wrestler should be ignorant of Satan's tactics. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul writes that Satan should not get an advantage over us, and that this should be so, we are not to be ignorant of his devices. Scripture clearly reveals his devices, and in the light of the Ephesian letter, Satan, we learn, will seek through his tactics, his devices, his wiles, his tricks, to attempt at least three things. Namely, he will seek to rob the Christian of the enjoyment of his spiritual riches. He will attempt to stumble the Christian in his consistent life for Christ. He will attempt to disarm the Christian for his warfare. Now, since the riches of the Christian are all deposited in the person of Christ, Satan will use his tactics to separate the believer in heart from Christ. Now, I wish to be clearly understood that once the believer is saved and baptized into the body of Christ, which he is the moment that he believes, the Christian is in the body of Christ forever. No power of Satan or hell can ever break the vital union between Christ and the members of his body. However, Satan can weaken the power, can seek to lessen the enjoyment of that union. And what does Satan resort to to accomplish this? Well, he's a great deceiver and a liar. He knows what can appeal to each individual to supplant Christ as the preeminent one in the heart. And by this tactic, Satan would rob Christ of the Christian's love and then of his loyalty which will soon follow. The early church was allured away from first love, as we read in Revelation 2, in the letter written by John to the very assembly at Ephesus. There we learn that the downfall of the church's testimony began, and from then on down to the present time, we see a steady decline to the lukewarmness of its condition today. To rob the Christian of the enjoyment of his riches, then, Satan will try to get something to displace Christ in the heart of the Christian. And to do this, he will lie and deceive just like he did in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3.13, we read, The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Satan, you see, used the beautiful creature, the serpent, as his mouthpiece. Since then, he has used men. Satan has seducers in his constant employ, and we read in 2 Timothy 3.13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The letter to the Ephesians warns us of these seducers and shows how necessary it is that the Christians grow spiritually mature so that they are not ensnared by them. In chapter 5, 6, we read, Let no man deceive you with vain words. And in chapter 4, 14, we read, That ye henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now let us see in what guise these deceivers come, so we may recognize them and discern their works. First of all, Satan uses men as false teachers. In Acts 20 and verse 30, Paul warned the Ephesian elders that such men would arise from among themselves, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. P. 
Peter writes also of false teachers in 2 Peter 2, 1-3, to and I quote, There shall be false teachers among you who shall privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feign words make merchandise of you. Now these false teachers are cunning in their deceit. They mingle truth with error. The truth furnishes the bait, and the error is the poison that kills the one who takes the bait. They spring up in so-called Christian circles. They come under cover, as it were. Though professing to know the Lord, they actually deny Him, His position, His person, His glory, and His honor. Their words are cleverly used, seeming to be like the epitome of scholarship, culture, and oratory. But they are but a part of the trickery so cleverly designed to beguile unthinking and untaught souls. Hence we need to observe the exhortation that to prove all things by the word of God. Test everything by Holy Scripture. Now the Holy Spirit takes special care to warn us of these apostate teachers in the days just preceding our Lord's return, and he discloses their origination as coming from Satan. 1 Timothy 4, 1, 2 tells us, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Well, so much for these false teachers. Then Scripture speaks of false prophets. God had his own prophets, Ephesians 4.11. And so Satan, very early in the church's history, gets his imitators into the picture. In 2 Peter 2.1 we read, But there were false prophets also among the people. And then the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24.11 told his disciples that in the end of the age, and I quote, Many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. There is indeed ample proof of the fulfillment of this prophecy today. Literally millions have been deceived and led astray by the many false systems and cults that have arisen in these last days through false prophets, all claiming to have received some special revelation from God but back of each one of them, my friend, is Satan, the arch-deceiver of men. Then, too, Jesus spoke of false Christ arising. How incredible as it seems, uh, yet this, too, is fulfilled in our very time. Now and again, some man arises and declares himself to be the Christ or the Messiah, and people deceive because they love not the truth. They are drawn into this following of this false Christ. Now the deception in all this is seen and warned about in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15, and I wish to read them. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now you see, in succumbing to all these false teachers and, uh, and apostles and prophets, souls are robbed of the precious riches of the truths of God, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Satan, through his workers, then, would first of all instill doubts into the mind, as he did with Eve in the Garden of Eden. He would instill the thought that God was not good because he withheld from her and Adam the fruit of one of the trees of the garden. And when Satan saw that he had her ear, he then proceeded to plainly contradict what God said 
God said that the day that they ate of the tree they would die, but Satan said, Thou shalt not surely die. Alas, she believed the lie of Satan. And this led to Satan's purpose to bring Adam and Eve to disobey God. Satan won that battle. Man fell. Sin came into the world and death by sin. Now to make the Christian stumble in his walk, Satan will seek to decoy him off the path of separation, that he might become involved and entangled in the affairs of this life. He would have the Christian tricked into crossing the barrier of separation by causing him to think that he can help by amalgamating with the world. Actually, instead, he becomes involved in promoting Satan's programs for this evil age. God says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Satan says, You should be yoked. Which will it be? An illustration of the dreadful loss to the believer who is thus tricked is seen in Lot. Lot thought that he could help in the affairs of Sodom and Gomorrah by becoming a judge in that city. Well, he didn't help the city one bit. It was destroyed. And Satan got his advantage over him so that his testimony to get out of the city was totally ineffective. Satan there won that battle. And then, too, Satan will use every conceivable bait to allure the believer off the pathway of simple faith. Jesus told his disciples, have faith in God. In other words, believe God, trust him believe what he says. Satan would always reason to the contrary, and the soul that succumbs to the reasoning of sight and goes off the pathway of faith will fall into sin, and Satan will win a victory. But what other ways will Satan work? Let us mention just a few. He will seek to divide the people of God. He'll seek to put one saint against another by fostering pride, causing misunderstanding. Oh, how sad this is. The only safeguard is for each believer to humble himself before God and to esteem others better than himself. Satan will also seek to distress with the events occurring around us. We see this today. Upon the earth there is perplexity. It's a day of trouble. The only remedy is for the believer to remember the words of Jesus, Let not your heart be troubled. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but in me ye shall have peace. Faith will rest upon him, believe his word, and be at rest. Satan will also seek to distract the believer, to keep him from looking unto Jesus. Men's hearts, we read, failing them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming on the earth. Satan busies himself to cause havoc all around, and then he gets us to look after those things, to become occupied with them, to be filled with fear and frustration, fretfulness, worry and care. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, would have us look up. Satan would have us look around. The Holy Spirit would have us fix our eyes upon Christ, whatever the circumstances. Satan, on the other hand, would keep our gaze upon circumstances to obscure Christ. If we look up, we shall be enabled to live above our circumstances by faith. And then, too, by looking to Him, we shall get clear guidance on all the perplexing problems confronting us. But if we look around, we are surely going to be confused and beneath and wholly unfit for the decisions and actions required. And then, too, Satan would use the weapons of discouragement and depression. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, would occupy us with Christ, and in the joy of the Lord we would find strength to overcome the discouragement and depression. 
But if the joy of the Lord departs, Satan has gotten his weapon to reach us, and soon spiritual strength will be gone. O Christian, let us remember the exhortation in Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Now in all this we might say that Satan will ever seek to appeal to the old nature of the believer, that is, to the flesh. Failure on our part to reckon ourselves dead unto sin and alive unto God will surely bring the activity of the flesh which will allow Satan to work. But the promise of God is this, if we walk in the Spirit we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we allow the Holy Spirit to control us, to occupy our hearts and minds with Christ, we will be kept by His divine power. Because remember this, greater is He that is the Spirit that is in you than he that is the devil that is in the world. Let us then live by faith in the heavenlies, in the enjoyment of the presence of our ascended Lord, and I assure you no tactic of the enemy will allure us into a snare and cause us to fall. And with our eye upon our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, we will be led by him in triumph over these spiritual foes. And we will not be decoyed off the pathway of faith into disobedience of God's word. And we will not be disarmed then of the spiritual weapons that we need to win this warfare over Satan and his hosts of spiritual wickedness.